Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Daniel Peabody. I am a director here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery and um, I want to thank you for being with us here this evening. Uh, we are going to speak with Modu Dang about his exhibition, A Post-Colonial Landscape, which opens uh, opened December 1st and will be on view through January 30th of 2000 and, or, uh, 2021. Um, the gallery is currently open uh, by appointment or a knock at the door. Uh, so if you're in the neighborhood, just stop by and uh, we'll let you in. We are asking people who come in to wear face masks. So please uh, be prepared to do that. Um, in addition to Modu Deng's exhibition, uh, Post-Colonial Landscape, we also have uh, Ed Burrell's exhibition continuing uh, into December, which is titled Studio Studies, a survey of drawings from 1958 to 2020. Um, and that exhibition is coinciding with an exhibition at the Portland Art Museum, Apex Ed Burrell. Um, and uh, that is on view at the Portland Art Museum through June 27th of 2021. Um, although I believe the museum is currently uh, closed for the Oregon um, freeze. So uh, do take a look at portlandartmuseum.org for details of when that exhibition is uh, reopened. Uh, also, we have our print wall. We have an exhibition of the Fragile Springs prints by Vietnamese artist Ding Kiu Le, um, and those continue through December as well. So tonight we have uh, for our conversation, Modu Dang visiting, uh, joining us from Chicago uh, and Mac McFarland from here in Portland uh, for our conversation about the exhibition a post-colonial landscape. Uh, Modu Deng was born in St. Louis, Senegal, and he is a multidisciplinary artist exploring um, symbols and myth uh, mythical power of pop culture uh, through mixed media and hybrid materials. Um, his work um, has, brings a split perspective uh, about uh, of the identity of blackness and Western philosophy. Um, he is exhibited internationally and is a co-founder of Black Puffin, a curatorial company based in Chicago. Um, he holds an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, he also has connections in Portland. Uh, uh, he lived here for a number of years, teaching at PNCA and running Work Sound Gallery, uh, and an art, uh, which was a gallery and artist studio space in Southeast Portland. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome here, him here. Uh, and I'd rather you were here in person after all, seeing to get to see you in person after all these years uh, or a few years since you've been here in Portland, but I'm thrilled to have you with us here online tonight. Um, we're also joined by Mac McFarlane, who is a cultural producer and educator and was recently appointed the executive director of Converge 45. Uh, he previously held the position um, at Pacific Northwest College of Art of Director of the Center for Contemporary Art and Culture. And um, I'm thrilled to welcome you both here this evening on behalf of myself and Elizabeth and the whole uh, gallery team. Welcome. Daniel. You Thank doing? you so much, Daniel. Good. How are you, man? Good to see you. Good, 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 good. So uh, what do you think of the show? Yeah, I mean, it was fantastic. I was I was really excited. I got to go through it um, before the holiday weekend. So that was nice to have it in my mind to kind of ruminate for a while um, before before we did this. And yeah, I mean, I was really struck. I mean, like there's so much architecture in so many of the paintings, actually. Um, you know, this sort of like abstracted floors, abstracted tiles. And then in this piece that we're looking at right now, the uh, Quai du Nord, the, the, what is it, the North Quay? Yeah, um, Quai du Nord, Quai du Nord, yeah. Yeah. You know, I really, like, I realized, I remembered that you had done um, a residency and you took all these photographs and then started creating these, um, you know, these kind of like mashup painting photography works. Um, and I was really struck by this piece, actually, and like how, uh, I don't know. It really, really illustrates the architecture. I feel like that you're using in a lot of the paintings. And maybe you could talk some about that architecture. Yeah, I like it. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Kathleen, Gwendolyn. You know, it's been great. You know, working with you guys for this show. You know, I'm really, really excited and happy that uh, it's in Portland. You know, why? Because, like you mentioned, I lived there for a while, and uh, you know, this is my first show in a while. So, you know. It's just great to go back to like places, place a place I know, people I know, and get this and where I got this wonderful respect and work with you, you guys. So I'm really happy about you know the outcome. It's a good beginning, and hopefully it's gonna 
you know, keep going and be great. So post-colonial landscape, you know, post-colonial landscape, if you think about the title of post-colonial landscape, I'm thinking about painting as a territory, but also I'm thinking about, you know, my country and Africa as a space of uh, colonizer, col col uh, colonialism and uh, also thinking about landscape painting, you know, just painting, you know, landscape painting. If you remember the first landscape painting, uh, you know, the American landscape paintings uh, happened in the Pacific Northwest, you know. So this idea of the, the sort of like discovery of the world through, through the country, through the land and getting the artist to bring it into the house, into the domestic life and have people sort of kind of travel through those images and get to know more about places and getting to know more about geography. So to me, you know, landscape means that. So the attempt of this show is to actually give you a landscape painting of where I'm from, you know, and not only that, place it in a post-colonial time, you know, meaning, you know, simply meaning that I live in a post-colonial time. I was colonized, you know, and, uh, and you have, like you mentioned, things like architecture that sort of remind me of that time or is there to witness to, 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 to witness that time. So, uh, so basically that's, that's where I come with architecture, you know, from being a kid living in a city that was built to be a French city and becoming an African city and becoming a Senegalese city and not knowing that as a kid, just loving the architecture and loving the place I live. I live in and loving my town and just like realizing later on how much of history is contained is this in this building and how much of my history and my identity is reflected through these buildings you know so i decided to photograph them as i was you know just growing up you know so it's been my love since and uh now my my i guess my work as an artist is to sort of deconstruct that history and deconstruct that that architecture that, that landscape and to see myself to understand myself and to get to know myself better in a more global world and in a more complicated world you know thinking about you know why why do we need a post-colonial landscape today you know why you know what's in there for us to to be informed or live with you know uh basically yeah yeah I mean, I feel like that, you know, like thinking about the the kind of urban environments that you're often working with and you have worked with, actually, um, since really I've known your work, you know, has really been about a, a kind of urban existence um, and how how colonialism, especially in Africa, um, has really shaped that urban environment. Um, and, and it's super fascinating to hear you talk about not you know, like as a kid, of course, you didn't like know that all of this, you know, had been that the structures had been put in place by the colonial powers. Um, and then as time goes on, you know, Senegal, like many of the African nations, then had to kind of undo and re reclaim um, this kind of architecture. Uh, and I feel yeah. like you're you're like you're grabbing that i feel like when you're like taking these photos and then like painting over them or in this piece which also to me really represents like a, a window you know yeah. um yeah well it's it, it, it's interesting just like to talk about african cities in general you know because those cities were built you know for a colonial need and then we, we got our independence and got our freedom and then we have to build on top of that history and we have to live within that history it could have been it could have it, we couldn't erase it. Like if you, for example, if you go back to uh, uh, the KG North, uh, it's like the, 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 the North Dock, basically the North Dock in my city, San Luis. I pretty much grew up next to this building. You know, it was three, three blocks away from my mom's house and I walked by every day to go to school, you know? So, uh, you know, the school was like five blocks away, you know? So it's a very small town, very claustrophobic. You know, so and this most of these buildings actually are, are are abandoned. You know, and so you know, growing up, you know, this actually was the one of the warehouse for the the rubber the rubber business because uh, mm. it was a big pot during the 18th, 19th century. 
And most of the rubber coming from Africa going to Europe would start, would go by this port and, and, and go to Europe to the, you know, so, and uh, just like speaking of the history of this building, you know, it was wealth, you know, it was colonial wealth, it was colonial power at its best, you know, and then all of a sudden everybody's gone, abandoned. And I always kind of felt that sort of richness about it, you know, and I also felt about that sort of mystery of who lived there and what they did in there and how they lived. Because you can, feel, you can see like traces of wealth too. Like you can look at the doors, the balcony, they are very grand, you know, and uh, you know, the inside paint job, they were really good, you know. So to me, again, bringing this conversation between the facade and the inside and the outside and how I per perceive it, and my work to kind of like negotiate domestic life, basically, you know, like how do you ne negotiate your own domestic life within this sort of context that is totally framed to be a place where you don't belong because it wasn't built for you. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that this idea of reappropriation re is there, you know, the idea of using the photograph as an image that come in to speak of the architecture, but also as a conversation between photography and painting, just as medium, because yeah. you know, you know, I learned I learned to paint through photography, you know. So uh, you know, and and photography, I would say, was even closer to me than painting, you know, because I I couldn't kind of find references in way which I can find reference, references in my neighborhood about photographers, you know. I couldn't find that in painting. There was no history of painting where I'm from or who I am, you know, so that kind of dialogue that come into like the domesticity of the work, also, you know, the, you know, painting versus photography, and how do I sort of like combine those two to create my new hybrid identity that would speak of my current state of life and identity within my history. Hmm. Uh, can I ask a question as well, Amodu? The, I mean, it's interesting because you're, you have obviously the, the architecture of the photograph, but then there's all of these, uh, you know, geometric and um, free form sort of marks on the surface. Um, and I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about that dialogue, both as a studio practice and as the way you're, you know, choosing your mark making, but then how it relates to that hybridization of those, the, the kind of contemporary experience and that history. Um, and then also I have a question from someone in the audience, Erica Dillon uh, is asking, uh, she'd love to hear more about the neutrality or not of the architectural forms. I'm sorry, she would love to hear what? Uh, Erica Dillon asked uh, her to quote her, she said, I'd love to hear more about the neutrality or not neutrality of the architectural forms. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's great. You know, hi Erica, you know, she's actually a collector and she owns one of my pieces. You know, so so it's it's interesting that you know I'm sure like I can see the conversations having with this show and the work she has at home. So you know, uh, but yeah, uh, I guess the the mark making and the patterning and the color, you know, all that come within my trajectory and my history. You know, so because I sit in a, you know I sit in between two cultures, my African culture and my sort of let's say Western to French culture. So, uh, you know, within those sort of parameters, you know, like forms, they come in, in different ways. Sometimes they come with, let's say they are, they are sharper and kind of like more leaning into like African sort of patterning, or they just, uh, you know, function as, you know, structure and space and, 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 and surface, you know. So, and, uh, you know, some of the things like if you look at, if you stop here, you can see this blue line with the arcs on top, uh, like in that sort of like a black space. Actually, that's the sun. The yellow is the sun and the blue line is the bridge. There is a very famous bridge in, in San Luis and Ayala. It was, it was lost. It was a bridge that was that left France going somewhere else uh, during the first war and kind of got lost. And they found it in few boats in Senegal at the dock, and then they, they built it there. So, and this is a very famous sort of kind of like a landmark. And uh, it comes often within my work to just speak of the idea of sort of like uh, jumping from one place to another and speaking also of, uh, you know, uh, bridging the gaps, you know, in between two cultures, you know. So, uh, 
And to, to, to answer to Erika, uh, not, I guess, you know, I don't think of neutrality when I think of color. You know, I, I, I guess, you know, uh, my color, they come with a very sense of, very specific sense of purpose, you know, you know, that speaks about my emotions and that speaks about my, my mood, you know, and uh, they, they are very much toned down in a sense that I call them, I call the, my dusty colors, you know, because, you know, like I kind of feel like they need to pack the dust of Africa in it, you know, to sort of speak of like my journey again, you know, like it's a very dusty journey, you know, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the red become a little bit darker, become less, less brighter, more darker, more kind of like going into the neutral tone he's talking about, you know, and, and even though, you know, uh, uh, you see so many of them, you know, I kind of like use, like to sort of sit with one or two or three and black and white when I work with, or on, on a palette for a menu. Let's look at the other uh, photographic work uh, in the show as well and the works on paper where you've collaged in some photographic elements and, um, and kind of connect that into this conversation and then maybe um, shift to some of the bigger uh, canvas-based works. <clears throat> yeah, can you tell me about this building? Yeah, well, this is, I went to a French Catholic school and this is the, the church of my school. And, uh, and it's been in ruins for a while. And it's the first church that was built in, in Senegal, in, in, in Africa by, the, by, by uh, the, the French Catholics, you know. So, uh, you know, it's the, it's the oldest church standing in, in actually West Africa, you know. So, uh, you know, uh, and it's, there is a lot of love I have for this church, for this building, because, it, you know, it was my first time sort of encountering like neoclassical without knowing about it, you know, and, uh, you know, and just like, it was such a very revered space and building, not because of the religiosity of it, not, not because of the religion, but just because it's, it was such a beautiful presence in the town, in the city that everybody lived to love and respect it, you know? So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about, of a town that you can cross in an hour, like it's very small. Very, very claustrophobic, everybody sitting on top of each other. So it's an island also. And we used to play on, on those steps, you know, during like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, recess, you know, mm. and, uh, and I have a lot of good memories there. So to me, like sort of just like creating movement and circulation within that context and sort of really appropriating this historical building and making it my playground to actually get to know myself and my identity, you know, was a wonderful try for this piece. Yeah, I love the way you're doing the marks on mark making on this work, where it's really integrating into the into the lights and the darks, but also the into the architecture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like. Uh, yeah, I call it uh, un vert de ciel because uh, uh, it's a green sky basically. You know, because green is one of my heart color. You know, it's really difficult for me to work with green because. Green is green, you know, it's really hard to make it something else, you know. So, uh, and, you know, it's always, there's always this kind of like duality I have, kind of like dance, I would say, or fight, you know, to get the green, to get the green, to get just right there where you can think of blue, but still green. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so that's, that's, that's what happened there. Yeah. And then the other smaller works in the exhibition, um, do you do you really like are these part of a process? Um, I mean, I know they're like their own finished works, but like do you tend to utilize these though, like as part of the process for making some of the bigger works? Yeah, they they they, they play in different contexts, you know. They play in a context in which that, you know, I'm not buying, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not like kind of like uh what what is the word? Uh handicapped by doing a painting or working on a photograph because you know those are like very difficult medium for me they come from a place of you know we within the dialogue of history and all of that and identity you know so when i go to these small ones it's on paper and i call them my drawings so i have more freedom to play because i'm not kind of like 
I'm not like put, you know, uh, I can't find I can't find the word in English, but I, I I'm not I'm not too sort of handicapped by it, you know. And uh, yeah, you know, by by the fact that it's a painting or a photograph. So they come that way, and uh, I have more freedom to play this form, line making and sketching and collage, you know, adding other media to it, and 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 also they are closer to my memory, to how I mm. sort of like see when I go back in my memory, how I see the place and how I imagine the place now within my own memory, you know? So, and, uh, you know, yeah. And they become work within their own right, you know? Maybe sometime, yeah. you know, I can grab from there to make a new, bigger, larger painting, but still I think, you know, they have their own autonomy, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can see that like your the kind of ideas that are in the larger works, you can start seeing those being teased out here too. Yeah. Um, which is really great. I mean, like maybe then we should really look at some of the bigger paintings um, um, and think about some of like the, the thing that aren't, that you don't actually see in those smaller works that are included in many of the, the larger pieces are actually an absence of a canvas where uh -huh. you cut away the canvas and are revealing the wall behind it or right. you're revealing the the support structures of the the canvas itself and maybe you yeah. can talk about those holes yeah like you know uh my 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 my, my european friends used to call me the the african russian bird <laughs> 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 and i you know between us i hated it you know but <laughs> but now yeah. I can see it, you know, there's a little bit of Rauschenberg in my work, a little bit of Jasper Downs, you know, in my work, you know, not because I'm looking at them, but because, you know, when they were here and when they did the work, you know, they sort of kind of capture their identity in a way in which they went against painting as a tradition, you know, they went against, you know, you know, painting as a European thing. they made it American, you know, and their way of making it American was to kind of like sort of question the surface and question the material and question the sort of like two dimensionality of it, you know, and coming from there. So that, that was like to me a reference to kind of like sort of like question my relationship to painting as a historical thing, which did not really sort of has have a, 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 a relationship with blackness or black artists, you know, you know, it, it within the sort of kind of like you know, uh, Western canon, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 uh, and by, and by sort of appropriating, you know, the American abstraction, you know, of course my work become more American, you know, but, in, but still, you know, it's an African who's making it, you know, so, and, 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 and that's where, you know, the sort of kind of like, you know, kind of like a relationship that is almost a performance that is almost performative because I'm imagining you know, my identity as a, as a black man, as an African on a Western canvas, you know, and uh, within the, the, the very much specific realm of abstraction and especially American abstraction, you know, so, you know, so yeah. So that's why they come and they become this sort of mixed media kind of like, you can almost like lean them against the wall. They don't even have to be hanged, you know? So, uh, you know, and uh, right. I do. It's interesting the way you, with the works on photographs, you are having this dialogue between your mark making and the structure of the architecture. And in some ways within the paintings, you're having a dialogue with the structure of the painting itself, as well as your mark making. There's something about this relationship to structure and mark making and form and color. And it's, it's very interesting the absolutely. way you bring the structure you're, you're out. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what's going on. Yep. And I guess maybe sticking with that mark making, one of the things I've noticed in these paintings, which I've, I'm totally in love with, is that they're almost entirely made up of small marks. Um, there's, there's not like a, you're not using a big brush stroke um, yeah. or a big tool. Like it's maybe two inches wide is like the, the widest. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very interesting question. <laughs> You know, because <laughs> because like it's you know it's it's a very sexy question, you know. <laughs> you know, because we're talking about sort of like you know the tactile element of my work, you know, 
you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, like there's a lot of touching, you know, in my work, you know, like, you know, like, I, you know, I, I don't use brushes, you know, because I want to be close to it, you know, and, uh, and also, you know, I have this relationship of sort of learning about visual making and painting through like, you know, running around, you know, and doing a little graffiti or tagging here and there on the street, you know, so you, you have to be fast, but also you have to be effective. And, uh, and those kind of like sort of relationship you have with, it's almost like falling in love with your own mark, you know, and you want to make it so specific and so precise, even though nobody's going to see it, but you see it and you, and you experience it, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, when I said you, the artist, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and here that's the same sort of like, it's almost like a body I'm like continuously, eternally caressing, you know, caressing and making sure it's fine, it's fine until it gets to the right place, the right mood, the right lighting, you know, and then here we go, you let it go, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you see, I mean, you of course have this amazing practice of, you know, sharing actually a lot of your making process uh, yeah. through social media, through Instagram, and like the kind of dance that you do, not just when you're standing back looking at it, but the sort of in and out dance that you have with the work is I, I, I'm always, I, I've actually thought about you as a tagger as in some of those moments. Um, yeah. So it's great to hear that, that kind of connection. Yeah, and also, you know, you know, the art of making is, is, a, is a performance or a performative art, you know, depending on which angle you sort of kind of see it, you know, and, uh, you know, and because like uh, you challenging yourself as an artist, to create an image and it's based on another image and you have to sort of give space to it but also there is this very much relationship you have just that you love to kind of like you know be in tune and in touch with the space you you're working with you know so uh you know yeah so uh yeah it's true that a lot of my mark are very you know also it comes also with i wouldn't want to go there but I i'm gonna say it you know, there is, you know, I always think about the people in Africa who, who, uh, who make uh, these mud houses, you know, and, uh, you yeah. know, and, uh, or, you know, or like the concrete people who build with concrete, you know, they are always kind of like continuously touching it, touching the building, you know, and just like making it smooth and smooth and smooth and sort of that act of like kind of building on the surface over and over and over, you know, is something that's really, you know, fulfilling for me. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe while we're looking at this piece, um, Black Target, I believe. Yeah. Um, can we, could you talk about the cardboard? Like there's a few of the canvases and even some of the smaller works where you're, where you're incorporating this cardboard material. Yeah. Um, and you're often leaving it raw. Um, yeah, I would love to just hear about like when you started doing that and like, and, and how like that started becoming part of the process. Yeah, this piece was the first piece that I used to target. Uh, I mean, I used a cardboard in this body of work, you know, because, uh, you know, let's not forget, I was making this work during the confinement, you know? So my only relationship to the outside world were these boxes being delivered all the time, you know? So the cardboard box become my life, you know? Everything was yeah. coming in and out of the cardboard box, you know? And then all of a sudden, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, George Floyd got killed and you have all of these people protesting and most of the sign in the protest were made of cardboard, you know, and, uh, and just like you have on TV, the cardboard, you have, you know, I have in my house, the cardboard, you know, so it was everywhere in my life, you know, and it was like, what was the medium between me and the outside? And also thinking about when I was a kid, when we used to go play or hunt, you know, we used to mark this cardboard as a target, you know, so uh, to, to shoot, you know, so, uh, you know, so that gave name, name to the painting, you know, black target. Uh, yeah. There's also something about layering more struct, you know, you're exposing the structure behind and adding structure to the surface as well. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I think a lot about, you know, what people see in me but also what people don't see in me, you know, because, you know, I'm a foreigner, you know, I'm a migrant, you know, and I'm black, you know, and I'm African, but also I have a French education. So like, how do you sort of 
you know, unpeel all of those marks and history, you know. So, uh, you know, so all of this kind of like patterning and layering also is like me sort of kind of giving justice to the visible and the not visible, that that's still part of my identity, but metaphorically, of course, you know. So, uh, you know, so, and, uh, you know, like, for example, when you, when you look at the mask also in the work, you know, they came actually, you know, within the fact that we had to, you know, we are wearing masks, you know, wear masks, you know, and I'm like, where is my mask? Where are my masks? You know, so <laughs> here we go. These are my masks, you know, and then speaking of like, in time of hardship, in time of crisis, we wear masks, you know, and in Africa, in time of hardship and crisis, back then, they got this mask, they put it on, you know, to sort of go to another dimension and try to find out what's going on you know, whatever that means, you know what I mean? So it, there is a lot of sort of parallel in, in the now and the past, you know, that I can sort of play in the layering too, you know. Mm -hmm. If I could, I'm gonna ask, uh, pass on two questions from the comments. Um, and David Slater uh, asked, do you see an evolution to a post-post colonial art where colonialism is no longer a major reference point where it has lost some of its relevance. Um, and then Christine Taylor um, asked, uh, how has living in the United States affected your point of view on painting and your relationship to your life in Senegal? And how has this informed your work? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go first with Christine. You know, like, uh, you know, I, I have to say that, I, you know, uh, I was just doing my classical training as an, as an art student in Dakar, Senegal in 1994, whatever, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, of course I was into like the punk music, I was into music in general, you know, and, you know, other form of music, hip hop, punk, whatever that was for I, you know, rock, you know, but I, I don't have much education within contemporary art or modern art. And I have to say, I, you know, I, I made a little bit of money and I bought this, uh, this magazine, this Beaux Arts magazine, you know, from Paris, and they had a big, you know, spread about Jean Michel Basquiat, you know, and you know, and when I saw those pictures of Basquiat and his painting, I was like, oh, fuck, this is this is this is this is this is, this is where I'm going, you know. So that, that that moment, I realized I had to go to America, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, and on top of that, you know, the American embassy invited a few African American painters who actually then were not that famous but now that's they are super famous you know to come do a workshop with us at the art school and uh you know there was Marie Lovelace O'Neill who just mm. did a show in New York during Armory you know uh and uh at, at Munchen Gallery you know and uh there was Frank Bowling you know you were Joe Over Street you know uh you know and they were all there working with us and telling us about sort of you know, how they deal with their own, you know, identity and, and painting, you know. And that was the first time somebody actually talked to me about, oh, you can talk about yourself on, on this thing, you know. So, uh, you know, so, you know, it kind of like just like sort of informed me into coming here to America and, uh, and becoming. So just to answer that, I knew about America before I landed here, basically. I fell in love with America before I landed here. And, uh, and since then, you know, everything that happened here has just become sort of kind of like, you know, like seeing my own life unfold as I imagine it, you know, so, so, and to speak of post post colonial, you know, you know, so we know about landscape and we know about colonial landscape. But can we imagine a post-colonial landscape? Can we imagine that if we close our eyes and think about post-colonial landscape, how does it look like? So, and, and then if you see it, you know, in your head, ask yourself, is it what's, what is here now? What is here now? Of course not, it's not. So it's an imaginary land, you know? So we don't know where it's going and we don't know when it's gonna stop. And, uh, you know, and I think the, the world as, as is since the beginning, we always colonized each other. And it's, it's been that history going 
coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And I think, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think we just should be aware of it and try to correct it, you know, and sort of give justice, you know, and acceptance to everybody and kind of sort of like extend, you know, our own territory and landscape. I have another question, if I may, then. Um, you are, oh, through, um, through um, uh, your role at Black Puffin, you, I believe you have been involved in the Dakar Biennial in Senegal, and you were just uh, recently there. Um, you're part of the curatorial team working on that biennial in, in Dakar. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I was looking at the project that manifested in that biennial this year was uh, because of the pandemic, I believe most of the projects have been postponed, but the one that was carried forward was a, was a, um, uh, a, a project where you are putting images of artists' work on buildings. And there's something that I, I, I uh, when I was spending time looking at the website, uh, and what I could see from you know Portland uh, of what was happening in Dakar with your project, I also then made me think of how some of your work you're taking images of architecture and putting images on top of them. And there was something about your your studio work that somehow felt like it aligned in some ways with the curatorial project you've been working on right now as well. And I just wanted to know if you had anything you wanted to add about that. Yes, uh, you know, like. Touche. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah, you you've been working hard. I can I can I can see now. So <laughs> so yes, like uh, actually the, the Biennale got postponed to 2022, and I was one of the artists selected to be part of the Biennale. But also I had a pet project, which was to you know bring some of my friends you know with me to Africa and Senegal and do some kind of like a curatorial project within Black Puffin. You know what I mean? And then when everything closed, all the museum shut down, everything closed, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there was an urgency of getting the art to the people, you know, and, and so I had this sort of concept, which was art for the people to the people, you know, meaning like uh, all of the, there was 18 artists selected. They were all of black descent and they are all from different regions of the world and uh, New York, LA, you know, London, Paris, Africa, you know, South America. So, and, and ask them to give me an original work, which was going to be reproduced to a large scale and then sort of put on display around the city. And you're right, you're, exa you're, ex you're exactly right that, uh, you know, this is one of the projects in which my art practice collide or kind of like folded within, you know, my curatorial practice, you know. But to speak of curatorial practice, I, I don't curate as a curator, I curate as an artist. You know, you know, I'm just trying to be sort of, because the most important thing about creating is to make sure, you know, that you have the integrity of the work and the vision of the artist in the message, you know, so, uh, and, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and it was perfect there to kind of like give justice to the people by giving them the art. They don't have to go see it. It's going to them. So the art went to them, you know, it went to them, to the walls, and, uh, and, and yes, you know, perfectly, you know, just thinking about Dakar, I talk a lot about Dakar as a city where I grew up and how it influenced my sort of vision and take on architecture or I mean, African and modern architecture. And to me, it was like, okay, you know, now I have a real opportunity to sort of kind of like give to my friend and artist who would not think of this as possible to just have their work there, right there on the street, like big, 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 big banners, you know? So, so yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I liked it and actually inspired me a lot, you know, in a sense that now I'm thinking about, you know, the city as an exhibition space, you know? And then that would, might come on my work as a new layer, who knows? Hmm. I'm also so curious about the way you collaborate within so much of your practice and your history um, and sort of like what what that brings to this body of work or to future bodies of work. Yeah, yes, yeah. You know, actually Portland taught me how to collaborate, you know, like uh, I remember uh, one of the students at PNC asking me, why do you collaborate, you know, like what's in it, you know, and, uh, you know, like, I guess 
you know, within my own trajectory as an African and, uh, you know, coming to Portland and teaching, you know, so it was a complete, it was the first time I felt very, very isolated, you know, so, uh, and uh, not just because of the place, you know, it, it, I've never been there and it's kind of away from, you know, so, and uh, one of the great, you know, experience I had there was, you know, to be welcome in that community, but also to have all of these people who are just curious to exchange with me, you know, and to, to, to know me and to discover what I have to say and what I have to add to the table, or what I have to add to the conversation. And, and you all know how work sound was, you know, it become this, you know, kind of like pastiche of like, uh, you know, whatever you name it, it's in there, you know. So, so, and that was like a very, very great playground for me to learn how to collaborate because uh, one of the most important thing I believe about collaboration is, you know, to be able to be, to put yourself, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see it from their eyes, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and that was a great try there. So, you know, not everything, I, I think, you know, any, any visionary, any personal vision would tell you that, you know, your idea is only, you know, doable when everybody wants to work with you on it, you know? So, uh, you know, so, which is of course, you know, what I learned through creating, you know, Black Puffin and having designers, artists, other curator, you know, all works on, you know, come in within their own expertise and their own vision. So all I have to do is just wear their shoes and, you know, see it through their eyes, you know, and work mm -hmm. with them. If I can ask one other question, you know, your, when I look at your paintings, specifically the larger pieces, um, like we're seeing the diptych here, Confessions, uh, to, the, to the left is um, My Blackness Should Not Offend You. And then on the other side of the room is Black Target and Penelope are some of the, the big uh, canvas-based paintings in the show. Um, the, it seems like the larger the painting, the more there's like layering. Um, and uh, there's something really, uh, it's hard to tell a little bit from, you know, a, a, a video of it over the internet, but in person uh, in particular and somewhat uh, visible uh, over the video here, um, the layering of color that you're putting in place and, and, and um, you know, in some places it's just green, but it's like three different greens or five different greens or different blues layered on top of each other. And you talked a little bit about, you know, the tactile quality of application and touching the, the, the canvas. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship to color and how you kind of build up the color and um, like, just like what that, yeah. what that means for you in the work? Yeah, I, you know, I, you, 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 yeah, you know, you're right. You know, everything you say, it's true, you know, and uh, I, it's hard for me to put words mm -hmm. on it, you know, because, uh, you know, I, you know, that's, that, that's who I am. That's how I paint. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so, Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, but I, I can see that, you know, like now I, I hear you talk about it. You know, like I can see that. Uh, I guess it's the struggle. You know, it's it's the struggle with the medium. Mm -hmm. You know, painting is a very difficult medium for me. You know, because you know it's 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 real. You know, like uh, you know, it's really really hard to paint. You know, because you know, like you don't know. You know, like if it's not good, everybody's gonna see it. You know, you know, and you know, like you can't lie with a painting. You know, it's good, it's good, it's not good, it's not good. You know, so, uh, and, and really, I'm, you know, I wanna play with the, the big guys, you know, when I talk about that, uh, like, even though, you know, you know, there is no art history within my own sort of history that goes with painting, you know, but I wanna be part of that history of painting, you know, so I really respect the, the canvas. So I give it my all, you know, I give everything I have when I paint, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, it should be your last painting, you know? You know, like, mm. if, what if it's your last painting, you know? You know, go for it, you know? So, and you never know when it's done, but, you know, and, and then it's done. Yeah. It looks like we do have another question. Uh, David Slater also is asking another question. He's asking if you see your work as a form of self-portraiture. 
No, because, uh, because like I said, you know, to Mark earlier, you know, the act of making to me is very performative, you know. So like when you talk about portraiture and self-portraiture, you know, like there is a notion of authenticity that comes in play, you know, and to me, authenticity is not a place of origin, it's a destination, you know, so, and uh, so meaning like the performative act takes you to where it's going, you know, and, uh, and it can be reinvented tomorrow, you know, so, uh, so there is not a recognizable, there is, there is no recognizable face, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, does it capture, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I can't speak for David, but I'm wondering if he's asking, like, do you feel like it's capturing some element of your identity, um, not necessarily your image, but of who you are? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of reading into his question a little bit, but I kind of, I, I mean, I don't see a portrait in this. You've talked about them in terms of landscape, but I guess my question is, do you see these as like the landscape that you inhabit? In yeah, which yeah, case, then they are kind of could be a portrait of you. Yes, I wouldn't call it a self-portraiture, you know, but I would call it, you know, uh, yes, I would call it, uh, you know, it's my environment. You know, it's, 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 you know, yeah, it's, of course, it has my energy, it has, you know, my resolutions, it has my way of seeing space, of constructing space, of navigating space, you know, because, like, for example, if you look at the, the gif my friend uh, Doug, designer based in Portland did, you know, I'm there making the painting and there is a grid in the painting and behind me, the painting become, the act of making become a grid and within that grid, you have these spaces where the color come in and play, go, come in and out, you know, so, so it's, 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 it's being built, yeah. And of course, you know, it's, it's part of my identity and it's part of who I am. It's my energy, but it's more of a process, you know. And it's also a, it's a very flat landscape that you've created here too, right? Like the, the depth really comes through from when you're removing the canvas, there's like this actual depth, yeah, but in terms can, of and, landscape, you know? Yeah, and you can see it as a facade and you can, yeah. see it, you can see it as a grid looking from above, eagle eye, you know, and you can see it as compartments where you can walk to like a little labyrinth, you know? So, you know, like for example, this painting confession, which is obviously a confession, a confession, a confession you know, uh, I don't know about what, but it is a confession, you know? So, and uh, if you look at the painting and you go up, my favorite spot there is the, 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 the yellow and red uh, uh, like bars, you know, we, like, you know, like you are from the inside and then you look out, you see the, the, the night light, it's dark, it's nighttime. And then on like the top left, you see a bit of a, you know, blue, blue sky, you mm -hmm. know? So, you know, like it's very abstracted, but I completely see an image of a blue sky and night light next to each other from my window bars, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have one other question, Bruce Morrison, who gave, who put on a comment congratulating you on your show earlier, but he also asked a question Thank you, uh, Bruce. To, you, to you, Modu, asking um, what do you think of Matisse's, Henri Matisse's relationship to French colonial history, which is a pretty big question, but anyway, passing it along. <laughs> well, Matisse was a, what do you say, a, a dilettante, you know, he was a dilettante, you know, so, yeah. uh, you know, like, so he, you know, yeah. he appreciated life, you know, he had a joie de vivre, you know, which you guys touch on, you know, on the press release, you know, so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and, you know, he, he had, you know, just think of it as, you know, he was on a personal journey, you know, so, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I like Cezanne more than I like Matisse, I have to say, you know, but- Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I, I like Cezanne, Paul Cezanne more than Matisse, you know, but, uh, but I really appreciate the work he did in Morocco. So, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and the way that he sort of like negotiated all of this angle of like sort of the, the foreign, the domestic and, and the self, you know, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, so, but yes, you know, uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's pretty good. It's a, it's a good response. Indeed. A dilettante, oh, a great example, a great, great uh, framing. Yeah. I do. I, you know, the one, the one, the, um, I don't, I don't know a lot about, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about uh, Henri Matisse's uh, relationship to French colonial history. Uh, I mean, I know some of the paintings that definitely have um, an element of, I don't know, what I would call uh, a perspective perhaps of exoticism that was brought in uh, looking at um, the colon, the, the, the places they had colonized uh, in a particular way, but I don't think that was unique to uh, Matisse. I think that was true of many uh, artists of that generation. Um, but one of the places where I do see a bit of a relationship, uh, and just visual relationship, is his later collage work and the cut paper and that layering of color and form. And I see a bit of that maybe in your work. Uh, yeah, like the, 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 yes, you, you know, like his, 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 his palette was very, is in form of Africa. Yeah, like he, he has an African yeah. palette. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, and uh, and also speaking of exotism, you know, uh, just like to bounce a little bit around the conversation about, you know, art from Africa, contemporary art from Africa, like there is a big conversation now that is that is sort of emerging about sort of like these two kind of, you know, the kind of like uh, exotic, you know, art, you know, which kind of lean more about the anthropological work that was done through colonization. And also, you know, because anthropology was there to just, Frame, frame black people, frame Africans, you know, put them in a box, you know, and uh, that's why you find so many masks in museum, but no contemporary painting from Africa, you know, so, and which sort of bring me again to the conversation of removing the canvas and adding mask, you know, sort of to speak of that absence of painting from Africa, but presence of mask, you know, and uh, you have these two sort of avenues that, that you can find now, which is the exotism and the more sort of kind of like post-colonial canon, which sort of lead onto like uh, art making through Western philosophy and view, you know. And I, you know, I think my work contain both. You know, I, I you know, I try to, to be fair to myself, you know, because I'm an exotic guy, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I am an exotic guy, you know, but also I went to <laughs> Western school, so. Right. How do you think that like absence of blackness within art history impacted you as a grad student or even maybe as an educator later on? Yeah, I think it gave me a chance to explore territories that I would have not touched on if, if, if I was you, let's say, you know, if I had this history behind me to back me up, you know, so, uh, you know, since like th th there was an absence of that to back me up, I had to create space where I can engage within that history and where I can create a new conversation that can go into that history, you know, and, you know, you know, because, you know, after all, this is history in the making, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, in terms of teaching, I guess, you know, like, you know, like the students come always with an expectation of sort of working within the canon or the textbook, you know, and I was there to sort of kind of like give them you know, a different view or perspective or choice, you know, coming from nothing, you know, just like, okay, you know, you just have to find your way around, you know, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, that's why I don't, I don't like to use art supply, you know, that's one of, one of the impacts, you know, because I don't want to shop for my painting. I want my painting to come from my life, you know, so most of the things I use or the way I use it, I want to make it in a, such a domestic way whether it's like through my street culture or my street art, or whether it's like through my own way of folding my clothes or sort of like erasing my board or using my cardboard, you know, just like make it domestic, make it domestic, you know. And again, speaking of abstract painting, the way it just destroyed European painting through Russian birth was just that, use, using the street of New York, you know, to create new paintings based on your life, your immediate life, you know. So, mm -hmm. it looks like we have another question from Erica Dillon. Uh, now that you're in Chicago, how are you seeing that landscape? 
uh, how is it uh, surfacing, if at all, in your ongoing studio work? Yeah, it's thank you, Erica. Yeah, it's a great question because I asked myself that question. I, I don't think I would have done this painting if I wasn't in Chicago, mm. you know, uh, because uh, again, you know, uh, you know, I like, you know, the, I like my sort of claustrophobia, you know, you know, like I like when things are like really tight, you know, and uh, you know, when like, you know, you almost get hit by a car. I like that, you know, I like that sort of dangerous try of life. You know what I mean? I like to live on the edge basically. You know, so and and Chicago is giving me a lot of that, you know. So and uh, and it's impacting, of course, my color choices. You know, it's impacting, of course, my mark making. You know, because you can say, you know, like, you know, it's sharp but fast. You know, and you know, and there is not much space to lean on to to relax. You have to just like, you know, keep looking and keep working on it. So, you know. And I think I'm at a time in my life in which I'm comfortable with my blackness, you know, and uh, and living in a city where I can fully experience that and try it, you know, is, you know, I think is also wonderful for my studio practice. Hmm. Okay, one I have more so question. many things I want to, I want to ask so much about that actually and like but maybe maybe we maybe we should have that conversation over some drinks sometime actually you know we will <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yes. man. it's good to see you yeah great to see you it's good to see uh, both of you and to see the show and i encourage people um i know that oregon is in um uh, the, uh, what uh, Kate, Governor Kate Brown is calling the freeze. Um, uh, and so I think people are uh, uh, definitely being encouraged to be out and about in public less. But uh, we do encourage people to come be see the show in person yeah. sometime between now and the end of January. Um, and again, it's uh, they can contact the gallery, uh, Elizabeth Leach Gallery, through our website or phone number. Um, and uh, make and, it and a yeah, if, Yes. Before I forget, I have to say that one of the most important part of doing an exhibition is to hang it, to, 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 really, to really know which piece is going where and next to which one. And I think you've done an amazing, incredible job hanging this show. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I know that you really wanted to be here and be a part of that, and we're not able to be this time. Uh, so we got to do a lot of exchanges of texts and... Uh, and phone calls and a lot of back and forth to come up with the right uh, hang. And I appreciate your input in that, not only in making the incredible work, but also in the layout. And I'm, I'm really, we're really pleased, Elizabeth, myself, the whole team are very pleased with how uh, it came together. And I'm glad you are as well. Yes, thank you yeah. so much, man. Thank you. Yeah. So it I, looks fantastic, yeah. Thank you. Well, I hope people can come in and see it. Uh, we are open Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, 10 30 to 5 30 by appointment or a knock at the door if you're in the neighborhood um and i want to thank everyone for joining us tonight we've had a great uh bunch of comments here uh, on the chat side and we want i want to thank everyone for your comments and um your encouragement and your great questions and i want to thank modu for the incredible paintings uh and for making time to have this conversation with us and mac i really appreciate your insight and uh, knowledge of uh, Modu and his work and, and being part of this as well. So um, I want to thank you all. And uh, I don't know if you have any closing words. Either of you? I don't. Go thank see you. the show. <laughs> all right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Come and see the show. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope to see it sometime in January if things get better. <laughs>